Okay, so welcome back after lunch. Our next slide deck is going to take us through some of the smart zone controller management, and we're going to try and teach you guys a little bit about the smart zone controller and its operation. So the smart zone is a product made by Ruckus, which is an enterprise network controller. It allows you to manage access points and switches from the same platform. It's highly scalable. It is multi-tenant capable, or it's also suitable for a single enterprise customer. So we have some uh, enterprise customers in New Zealand that have Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch branch offices, and they have deployments of you know, up maybe two, 300 access points across all their sites, and it's all managed by a smart zone platform. The smart zone itself is available as a piece of hardware, as a one RU appliance, as well as being available as a virtual machine. So this slide here breaks it down for us. On the left hand side we have our smart zone essentials edition, which is more suitable for an enterprise customer. And then on the right hand side we have the high scale, which is mainly suitable for a managed service provider or someone who's going to be providing centralized network services that are multi-tenanted. So on the essential side, we have the Smart Zone 100. The newer version of this is the Smart Zone 144. To be completely honest, the virtual appliance is far more cost effective, and you can just run it on, we'll have a chat in a moment about what, what platforms it runs on. And then the same applies to the high scale. Most customers, including Network for Learning, choose to run the high scale edition as a virtual machine, as opposed to a piece of hardware. Just some numbers here. The Essentials edition of the Smart Zone is able to support up to 1,024 access points per controller. We can cluster the controllers together to give us a total, in this case, of, what do we have here? It would be 3,000 3, access points for a Smart Zone Essentials cluster. On the right-hand side, we start to really get into the scale. An individual controller in the high-scale edition is capable of managing 10,000 access points, which means we can have 30,000 access points for our entire network. Now, we expect by the end of the program we're doing with the ministry, we will probably be approximately four smart zone platforms in operation to support all of schools in New Zealand. As of today, there are currently two in operation, but I would expect we'll get to four as we grow the project. What's the difference between the essentials and the high scale? What's the difference between the essentials and the high scale? So they're, they're the same software. You just need to select one or the other, but it obviously it consumes more resources. So you just need to choose when you do the install, like can it, you want essentials, do you want high scale? Um, it, it's also the profile, right? So, so what happens is if you choose the essentials edition, yeah. Although it can only support 1,000 access points, the logging in the Essentials Edition goes for longer. So for example, you can go back a couple of months and look at all of your reporting history in the Essentials version. What we've done is we've tuned the database inside the profile so that it's more friendly to keep data for long term, but you have the trade-off is you have the fewer amount of access points that you're managing. Whereas with a high scale edition, we've tuned it so that the log files really only last a week, but you can cater for up to 10,000 APs per node. So it's the same software as Adam says. So when you say in Corella Lab 4, you mean four clusters, right? Yeah, let's talk about that. That's a great question. So within a smart zone cluster, we can have up to four nodes. And so this is an N plus one cluster. So three of those nodes will be active and the fourth node sits there as a hot standby. So if one of the other nodes fails, it will take over the load. And so that's why we say it's 10,000 access points per controller, giving us 30,000 for the cluster, but we have one that sits there as a standby. And that, would that be the same if they were the virtualized? Correct, right. absolutely. And this applies for virtual and physical. You still have to break it up yeah, so, so the way it works though is you could have one, two, three, or four controllers. So if you wanted, you could have two controllers, one is a standby, but they're both active in reality. So what would happen is the access points actually get distributed automatically between your two controllers. And if one of the controllers goes offline and you've got enough capacity, the remaining controller will pick up the load. So if you just want some simple redundancy, you can deploy two. But if you have a larger scale network, then you can deploy three or four. Can you put all 
Four virtuals on the same hypervisor, or that yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. You, if you wanted, yeah, if you wanted, you could put all four VMs on the same host. But if that host dies, you're going to have a problem. So it makes sense to distribute it. Yeah. Um, Speaking of hypervisors, and sorry, go ahead. Cluster, do they have to be all hosted at the same location, or can you have? No, them, they can be. Auckland Vines in the Christchurch, and have them all still talk correctly to each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's one caveat. We require, and it depends on the software version. 100 milliseconds? Or I think it's 30. Um, it depends on the software version, though. Okay. So uh, the, the general rule of thumb is you need to have less than 30 milliseconds latency between cluster nodes. Um, so that's achievable from Auckland to Christchurch, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah that's 10 milliseconds. Yeah. yeah. They have their own dark fiber or something? Uh, I don't think they have their own fiber, but they do have a link from somebody that provides them like a layer two service with minimal latency. It'll be like some pairing link. Yep. So Excellent. So speaking of hypervisors, officially the Ruckus smart zone platform is supported on VMware ESX, Linux KVM, which is a free hypervisor from Linux, and Microsoft Hyper-V. So officially these are the three supported hypervisors which you can run a Ruckus virtual smart zone on top of. Additionally, if you've got deep pockets, and I say this because a smart zone requires a minimum 13 gig of RAM. So to deploy a VM inside of Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Engine or the Microsoft Azure platform, which has 13 gig of RAM, is going to run you into about three or 400 bucks a month. Um, so it is possible. You can deploy in a cloud-based service. We do support that but it will be quite expensive if you do it that way. So you really want to have your own server file or grow your own cat? Yeah, my suggestion is to have your own server. And to be completely honest, as you can see today, we have ours running on a Mac Mini. Mm -hmm. so you don't need a big beefy machine to run it. Does it have to run inside a hypervisor? Absolutely. So it can't be run on, on bare metal? No, nope, it's not supported on bare metal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll sell you a piece of hardware. something that had a bit more grunt. Put more VM resource into it. Yeah, but yeah. You, if, you, if you wanted a, just a single scale, you couldn't go and buy a high end Xeon and dump yeah. it onto that and go, sweet, it's fine. Now you'd need to put VMware in between. Yeah, so yeah. you had to do it. Absolutely. Hypervisor and then dump everything into your virtual machine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I apologize, this slide is completely wrong. Uh, what, we, what should happen is this should actually say North Island, that should say South Island, this should say South Island, that should say North Island. And so this is an example of how you could deploy a smart zone solution uh, with redundancy. So we've spoken about the four controllers that exist inside of a cluster. We also have this solution which is called cluster redundancy. So we also have the ability to take another four nodes and form another cluster. So if your entire data center blows up, you can fail all of your devices over to another data center or another cluster. And this is actually how the team at Network for Learning have implemented their redundancy. They have a cluster in Auckland, which fails over to a cluster in Christchurch. And then they also have the reverse of that. They have a, uh, the idea is that schools in the South Island will connect to the Christchurch data center. And if that becomes unavailable, they'll back up cluster to Auckland. So as of today... Does backup cluster have different IP address? It does, absolutely. Yeah, how, how does that work? If an AP is looking for a, <coughs> a or a switch is looking for a specific IP to yep. manage it, when that IP becomes available, is it, is it aware of its backup? So what happens is every access point and switch has a primary cluster. Uh, so, and we've discovered, uh, sorry, we've discussed as to how you can deploy the DHCP option or manually configure it to talk to its IP address. The primary cluster is aware of the backup cluster. And it has to be aware because every 24 hours, the primary cluster sends its configuration data to the backup cluster. So keep that in mind as well. If you make configuration changes right now and the system dies in a couple of hours time, those changes will not be present in the backup cluster because that sync occurs every 24 hours. Is that changeable? Like if you are in a situation where you need more active backups? Yeah, no, it's, it's just, just 24 hours, 24 hours at this stage. Can you can manually push a sync, yep. Uh, but that can only be done by the system level administrator. Um, so, 
In a situation where you have a primary cluster and a redundant cluster, because the primary cluster is aware of the IP addresses of the redundant cluster because they have a relationship with each other, the primary cluster pushes an IP address list for a backup cluster into the access points when they connect. So remember how we had that command, which was get scg, and it shows us the controller IP address? If we had a backup cluster configured, that would also show us the IP addresses for the backup cluster. So there's like a server list, and in this example, we've just got one smart zone, but um, you can see the comma. Yeah, there's also that. So the failover list is basically the backup cluster. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so I know a lot of people in this room work at schools who potentially still have Zone Director controllers. And I, and I think here we have Zone Director 3000 in use that we're using for the guest network today. Yep. The Zone Director 3000 has 500 access point maximum, and we have the Zone Director 1200, which can support 150 access points. For a couple of years now, you've been unable to purchase Zone Director 3000 because it's an end of sale product, so you can't buy these anymore. Today, you still can buy Zone Director 1200, but it's almost gone. Adam's waving his hand. He's like, no, no, don't buy it. Because <laughs> um, there is newer technology, right? You shouldn't really be buying a Zone Director anymore um, because there's, there's better technology now. So we know that there's quite a large install base out there of schools using Zone Directors. So we built this tool that allows us to migrate a school or a customer from an on-site Zone Director towards a Smart Zone platform. And so this is the website. I see Kevin busy typing it in now. So to be honest, this was a tool that we developed locally in NZ. And the conversion from an on-site zone director to a smart zone is a two-step process. The first part in this process is to copy the configuration from the on-site zone director and push that into a smart zone. And so we, cre we created this tool that does that. Um, so here's a quick screenshot. So this tool basically allows you to upload your Zone Director backup. Now, just to note, Zone Director backups are encrypted. So you have to have the username and password of that system in order to upload that file into here and process it. So once that's complete, the next screen of this wizard asks you to enter the Smart Zone credentials. So you put the public IP address, your username and password of the Smart Zone, and then this tool will push your Zone Director configuration into a specific zone in the smart zone controller. And this is the tool that Infrel have been using to successfully migrate quite a number of schools now away from on-site zone director to their smart zone platform. So you use the word public IP address. Can yes. it not go to one on your network? Sorry, can you say that again? Well, if you have your own smart zone rather than... Yes. If you have your own smart zone, you will need to temporarily open a port forward on your firewall to allow this tool which sits on the internet to get into your smart zone and push the config. Any particular port? 8443. Yeah, which is the same port that we use for smart zone management interface for the UI. I just to ask a question if the smart zone controller, sorry, if the zone director, zone director has died. What do you do? Um, well, hopefully, you've got a backup. Uh, if you don't, um, There is. there is. So uh, there's a number of different ways we can do it. So if you've got a school and the zone director's died and there's no backup, and you've got, say, 50 access points which are deployed, option number one is to get a replacement zone director, drop it in on site, the access points, and put it on the same IP address as the previous system. The access points will automatically connect, and then you can go through this standard process. Option number two, if you can't source a replacement zone director, and I know the team at Network for Learning have done this because we've worked with them, is to individually, remotely log into each access point that's on the network. So if you've got 50, it's going to take you a little bit of time. And then you can issue some commands to the access point to tell the access point to start communicating to a smart zone controller. So it is possible to do it. I think it would take them a couple of hours probably if you had like 50 APs. Yes. Yeah. No. So. All right. So you're saying that Infrel take a 
back up. My understanding yeah. is, that, is that that is the one time that they take a back up. Yeah, the, for sure. So they should be able to draw from that, shouldn't they? Yes, absolutely. If, if somebody has a backup, and no matter how old it is, so long as you have the username and the password for that backup, you can use that. I don't think many small schools have actually realised that they've got usernames or passwords. Well, it's yep. worse than that. It's the admin of the zone director, isn't it? It's Correct. It's necessarily what you log into it. Because if you've connected it to AD, you log in the AD credentials. That's true. It is the system username and password for the administrator user. That's generally not an issue because we've got all the documentation for when it was installed. And if they haven't changed it, then... Yep. Okay, it was us saving. So where's the um, zone director to unleashed tool? No. <laughs> no. We do not have one of those. Um, so... As I say, this is a two-step process, right? So, so far, all we've done is taken the config from the zone director and pushed it into the smart zone. At this point, all the access points are still talking to the zone director. The second step of the migration is to run a script which tells all of our access points that are online to rehome themselves to a smart zone controller somewhere. And this script that we have, we actually went through the process of creating a document for Network for Learning because of this process. Um, I can make this document available to anybody. What it is basically is a bunch of commands that you will run on the zone director command line, which pushes out to all of your access points, which tells your access points to change their firmware and then move to a zone director, uh, sorry, smart zone controller. So it's a two step process, configuration and then access points moving over. So there's, this process has been used quite a number of times now. Like I, I would say there's well over three or 400 schools which have been through this process.